Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii in the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, how is Lent treating you so far? Um, I mean, those of you who have, what have you given up? I, I just love that talk about giving things up for Lent. Was it a bad habit? Was it something you should be working on all the time anyway? Well, St. Paul actually takes us to a much more challenging kind of Lent, a much more challenging kind of life, really. He's not talking about setting aside what you already know isn't good for you. Lent isn't for giving up what you already agree is useless. Actually, he's suggesting that we get dead as a congregation, not dead to others, but dead to ourselves, dead to us, plural, not in a literal way, of course, but as a metaphor for allowing something new to come alive. I hope you heard the way St. Paul is speaking here in this lesson. He's talking about setting aside things, but not the way that the majority of people usually do that in Lent. He's actually talking about having set aside what he's gained, what he has valued highly. What his best accomplishments were, those are the things he's setting aside. Even what gave him some kind of status and recognition in his religious community, it, it's kind of a way of talking about getting dead to those things. He counts it all as rubbish, he says. It's literally a harsh word. Rubbish is kind of a, a sanitized translation. The word we, we really ought to use uh, ought to be the one you say when you drop the noodles. Huh? That's what he counts this as. Paul doesn't apologize for being blameless under the law. He doesn't say that he's sorry for being born into the favored tribe of Benjamin. He doesn't turn his back on his wonderful education, a Hebrew's Hebrew. It's just that none of it ever got him where he wanted to go. If anything, these things were distractions, he says. Keeping his resume up to date prevented him from seeing where God was working beyond what he could see on his computer screen. Keeping up with the quotas kept him from recognizing what those numbers really meant. When all was said and done, Paul was on his way to Damascus to show off his total zeal for God but God grabbed hold of him and sat him down and gave him a three-day timeout to rethink the whole thing. 
And that's what we get each Lent at the very end, a holy week and a three-day time out to rethink the whole thing, a time to put our congregation's accomplishments aside, a time to check any possible self-righteousness at the door, a time to see where God is working outside our normal expectations, a time to realize that our preoccupations with just being here may very well be the same things that are keeping us from doing what we're called to do. Those three days for Paul may very well have been his three days in a spiritual grave. It was a time of total loss. It was his time to be, to be dead, dead to himself, dead to all that had brought him status with God and others, dead to all that stood in the way of gaining Christ and the power of his resurrection. But Paul came out the other side, re realizing that he didn't have a righteousness of his own, which came from his accomplishments, but rather one which comes, he says, through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. But here's the thing, when Paul talks about faith in Christ, those same words can also mean the faith of Christ. One way, it sounds like what Paul is doing one more piece of his resume, one more credential. Paul of Tarsus, true believer, yay, you know? But those same words also mean through the faith of Christ. So maybe the whole thing is not about how much we believe in Jesus, but maybe how much Christ believes in us. Paul is talking to a congregation here, a group of people, we, plural, believing in Jesus is not a bad thing at all, but it can be deadly. Believing in Jesus doesn't guarantee that worthwhile things will actually happen because we believe. There are thousands of believers in Jesus who never get anything done for the sake of the gospel. But if believing in Jesus can be dead, Jesus believing in you is alive always, and it'll kick us out the door like it did with St. Paul, kick us out with something to say, with something to do, to take our mission as becoming like Christ in his death is no small thing. It's costly. It's the way that love leaves a hard heart broken open to grace. It's the way that true servanthood always involves losing part of oneself. It's the only path to resurrection and new life, for truly the power of resurrection can only be known by those who have died. That's the scandal of the gospel. You can't get to Easter without the cross, and you can't find life without God, with God without dying. The power of Jesus' resurrection is a work in progress, begun brand new each day, calling us out from this life into God's future. Follow me to Golgotha, to an empty tomb of your own. Press on. The gift is for those who are getting dead.